What I wanted to share today uh, is from a verse that we have really cherished in our church through the years, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and verse 3. That's a verse that we've often mentioned at our church, and uh, the Lord spoke to me a little bit more about devotion. What does devotion mean? If you look with me there, it's a verse that hopefully everybody knows. If you don't know this verse, children especially, if you haven't had the chance to have this verse written on your heart, I would encourage you to make it a memory verse in our homes. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds, disciples, will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. And we've talked many times about the, uh, the importance of maintaining a simple and pure devotion to Jesus Christ. And the question came as I was reading um, Isaiah chapter 42, what do I think of when I think of devotion? If, if you think about what does it mean to be devoted to Jesus, children especially think of this. If the Lord says, I'm afraid you'll lose your simple and pure devotion to Jesus, what is devotion? How do you know if you're devoted? Is it good feelings? Is it memorizing lots of verses? Is it um, eloquent prayers? What is the mark of devotion to Jesus Christ? And I was blessed, as I mentioned, from Isaiah 42. If you want to turn, there's a verse here that spoke to me uh, about a mark of devotion that, that I've um, overlooked before. And I wanted to mention, because I think that, that uh, it's easy to overlook this. It says in Isaiah chapter 42, in verse 19, it says, Who is blind but my servant? Who is so deaf as my messenger whom I send? Who is so blind as he that is at peace with me? Are so blind as the servant of the Lord. And we see here from this verse, it, sa it says that the devoted one, it's what my margin says, who is so blind as the devoted one, the devoted one is especially blind. And I have to admit that when I think about devotion to Jesus Christ, blindness isn't something that comes to my mind immediately. And the Lord reminded me that I have to pursue that blindness, the blindness that I admitted when I came to the Lord, when I said, Lord, I can't see, I don't know what's right. I don't know the way to go. Would you lead me, Lord? I, it's a, there's, a, there's an admission of blindness there when I came to the Lord, when the Holy Spirit says, I'm afraid that just like the serpent deceived Eve from dependence upon and leaning upon the Lord and being totally insufficient in herself, he's going to lead you away from pure and simple devotion or pure and simple blindness. And we have to be very careful not to think of blindness as a bad thing. Uh, it's good to be blind. It's good to need the Lord, to depend upon him, to not know right and wrong ourselves. If you look with me at John chapter 9, there's an interesting interaction where the Pharisees, where Jesus actually heals a man who's born blind. And then um, <clears throat> there's, a, there's an interesting part where in, uh, in verse uh, 39, Jesus says, for judgment, I came into this world so that those who do not see may see and that those who see may become blind. And those of the Pharisees, it says, John chapter nine, verse 40, who were uh, with him, heard these things and said to him, we aren't blind too, are we? What do we see there? The Pharisees thought being blind, that's a really bad thing. We aren't blind, right? And look at what Jesus says in verse 41. If you were blind, you wouldn't have any sin. But because you say you see, your sin remains. And there we learn something very important that if, if what does Jesus mean here? I don't know all, all of it, but one thing it speaks to me is um, when he says, if you were blind, you would have no sin. If you were blind, you'd be totally dependent upon me. If you were blind, you'd be asking me for leading and guidance and help and everything. And you wouldn't have sinned. But it's, why do you still have sin? Why do your, what does your sin remain? Because you're convinced you know the right thing to do. You're convinced you have the right answers. And so because you say we see, you don't lean on me. You don't ask me for help. You don't listen to my voice. Therefore, your sin remains. And so one way we can take 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3 is don't be led astray from, total, from pure and simple and total blindness. 
<clears throat> That's how we came to the Lord, with pure and simple, total blindness. But like the Pharisees who questioned Jesus, if we aren't careful, we can, as we walk with the Lord for a while, and as we become more familiar with the scriptures, and as we become familiar with our routines and our, you know, the, the, the <clears throat> externals of the Christian life, we can start to think, ah, it's kind of bad to be blind. It's kind of bad to be needy. And we can say to the Lord, I'm not blind too, am I? No. And the Lord may say to us, no, but because you say you see, your sin remains. And I was thinking, what do we do when we can't see? If you've ever seen someone who's blind, what do they do? Or, you know, or, or even if we just close our eyes, you've got to get through the room and it, maybe it's pitch black. What do you do? There's a groping. And I, I was thinking, especially there's listening closely. What do we do when we cannot see? We listen. What's the mark of the devoted one who's the blind devoted one? He listens closely to the Lord. Jesus said that's the, one of the first things he said in his ministry in Matthew chapter 4. Men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds from the mouth of God. So we see there that hearing God's word is what gives us spiritual life. And if we aren't listening, spiritual death is setting in. If we aren't listening every single day, and just like in Genesis chapter one, now Brother Zach has told us before that every day God spoke and something happened. That's God's desire for our lives as disciples too. It's how it must be for us. Every day God speaks and something happens because we listen. Who is so blind as my servant? I'm afraid that you might lose your pure and simple blindness, that you might lose your listening ear. And that's the burden on my heart today, that we, unlike the Pharisees who've become accustomed to the religious teaching, and it says actually in John 9, it's the Pharisees who were with him. Because earlier we see there was a disagreement among the Pharisees. Some of them said, this guy's, you know, he's not trustworthy. But others said, can, can a sinner heal a blind man? And there were some who were with him. And they had some degree of light. They had some degree of knowledge. They had acknowledged Jesus is special. And it's those ones who started to think, maybe we can see a little bit. And especially as we look around the world around us, we see people in darkness. And we can think, too, we have more light than they do. We can see. And that's when the danger sets in, family. When we start to think, oh, yeah, I can see. We can't see. We're every bit as blind if it's not for the word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And the only way that we can be any different is if we are receiving day by day, the word that is uh, proceeding from the mouth of God, we have to listen to him every single day. <clears throat> so how do we listen? We have to read God's word for sure. And I wanted to mention children, if you're old enough to read, you should be making time to read God's word can be very simple, but I can, I know for myself, and it may even seem like a rule to begin with. That's fine. The scribe must become a disciple over time, but definitely start by being a scribe at least. Come to know God's word. Come to value it. I, I can see how, because my family emphasized knowing God's word, there were seeds that were planted long before I became a wholehearted and sincere disciple, but seeds that were planted that gave me a fear of God and that kept me from, from ruin and that, and that I could come to appreciate more fully later. It's a very good thing to read God's word, but even more than reading God's word, what does it mean to listen to the Lord? It means to listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit and our conscience throughout the day. When, the, when our conscience pricks us, we should be sensitive. We should be responsive. We shouldn't put things off until tomorrow. We should settle them. As it says in the Proverbs, don't tell your neighbor, you know, come back and I'll give it to you later when you have it to give now. If the Lord puts something on our hearts, we have to respond immediately. And here, one thing I'd see is there is a difference between hearing and listening. What's the difference between hearing and listening? I was talking with one of my daughters about this earlier today. You can hear something, but it can just kind of go in one ear and out the other ear. But listening, listening is different. It's paying close attention. And when, it, when, when, I'm, when I say that we have to, the blind person is one who listens to the Lord. It's not just that I hear him. And we can get in the room, so to speak. We can open our Bible and we can hear. Technically, we've heard. But there's a big difference between a hearer and a listener. And that's in James chapter 1. What's the difference between a hearer and a listener? James chapter 1, in verse 22, it says, Prove yourselves to be doers of the word 
and not merely hearers who delude themselves. So we see there that there are hearers and there are doers, which I would say are listeners. And it's not just the hearers who are, um, who are blind, but it's those who have listened to God's voice. Often it says that uh, it's who, you know, Jesus says, who hears my word and observes it or hears my word and does it. And it's the doing that is so important that we can't neglect. And one of the things I would mention is it doesn't, we want to be doers of the word, not speakers of the word. And at NCCF, I know in our church, because we emphasize prophecy so much, there can be a little bit of, uh, we can start to emphasize speaking because we take the exhortation to prophesy and to desire to prophesy seriously. We can take the exhortation to speak wrongly and we can think, okay, I hear the word and then I speak it. But what it says is Jesus did before he taught. And for us, the important thing isn't, isn't regurgitating the word we hear, it's doing the word we hear. And if we want to be a listener, we need to be a doer of the word. And then as the Lord gives opportunity, for sure we can speak, but we, have, we need to be careful. We can kind of congratulate ourselves, so to speak, that we're speakers of the word. And if you're participating regularly, if you're seeking to be a fully functioning member of our church at NCCF, you can congratulate yourself. I can congratulate myself and say, I'm a speaker of the word. But it's not the speakers of the word who will be justified. It's the doers of the word, those who listen and observe God's word. To me, one of the things that I've noticed that the enemy can do is he can get me as, I'm, as, I, as I set my heart to listen. There can be a little bit of a doubt. Is the Lord really going to speak? Is he really going to lead me? Can I really count on him to lead me? And there's a verse I wanted to mention from 2 Chronicles in chapter 15, if you'll turn there with me, that really encouraged me. Second Chronicles 15 and verse two, it says that, uh, it says, listen to me, Asa and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you when you're with him. And if you seek him, he will let you find him. I love that. If you seek him, he will let you find him. And so to me, what that's, what that's encouraged me with is the question isn't, is God going to let me find him? No, for sure he will. If I seek him, he will let me find him. The question, though, the uncertain part is, will I really seek him? That's the uncertain part. As Jesus said, you know, I think Luke chapter 18, when the son of man comes, is he going to find faith on earth? And he defines faith there in that passage as crying out day and night. They're constantly seeking. And the question, and for me, there can be that little bit of a subtle doubt. Is the Lord really going to allow me to find him? And what's encouraged me is, and even here, if you look at Second Chronicles verse uh, chapter 15, just later, it says um, in, in verse 15, it says, All Judah rejoiced concerning the oath, for they had sworn with their whole heart and had sought him earnestly, and he let them find him. I love that. He let them find him. And that's a confidence we can have, too. If we seek the Lord, he will let us find him. And the, the doubtful part isn't whether he will let us find him. The doubtful part is, will we seek? Will we seek him full of confidence and expectation? Day by day, Lord, I'm just as helpless as I've ever been. I've walked with you all these years. I'm just as incapable of discerning right and wrong. I'm just as incapable of knowing which way to go. I'm totally blind, Lord. I'm as blind as the first day that I came to you. And I want to preserve that pure and simple blindness. So what's the danger one danger is experience. As I said, the longer we walk with the Lord, the, 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 the potential grows that we neglect that blindness. We neglect that listening ear. Je Jesus said a couple of times in Matthew chapter 19 and Matthew chapter 20, he says at least twice, um, many who are first will be last. Meaning, and one, one way we could take that is people who start off early, they kind of neglect they, they, they aren't as diligent. People who are last, they might be first because they, they run with zeal. And as he says in Revelation, you've forgotten your first love. What does it mean? In part, it means I neglect listening. I start to think I can see a little bit. And we see that even in the story in Second Chronicles where we were just looking in um, chapter 16, the very next chapter. It says in the 36th year, verse 1 of Asa's reign, uh, Basha, the king of Israel, came up against him, and Asa brought out silver and gold, and he basically went to the king of Aram, and he asked for help, and the Lord rebuked him. 
And what spoke to me is this is, you know, there's this amazing uh, verse in a couple of chapters earlier in, in chapter 14, where the Ethiopians come up against Asa and Asa said, prays in verse 11, Lord, there's no one besides you to help in the battle between the powerful and those who have no strength. And the Lord delivers them amazingly. And the Lord um, delights in delivering them. But you fast forward 25 years, that's something like 10 years into his reign. And he was fresh and he, and he knew he was blind and he couldn't see and he was, he was listening carefully. But then you fast forward 25 years, he's, he's been walking with the Lord. He's diligent to do lots of things. And what do we see? He started neglecting that, that listening muscle a little bit. And the Lord rebuked him. And it, was, it, it doesn't go well for Asa. You can read in chapter 16, the rest of that story. It doesn't go well. But if we trace back the point, he was, it wasn't at the beginning of his journey that he was in danger of neglecting the Lord's commands. As it says in Hebrews, I think, chapter 2, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? We have to preserve that listening ear. And that's what I want to say, just to close with 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3 again. I am concerned for you that as the serpent deceived Eve, your minds would be led astray from simple and pure blindness, from simple and pure listening. Are we losing that sense of blindness that we had when we first came to the Lord? I can't see. I don't know anything, Lord. Teach me. Lead me. Help me. How's our listening muscle? Is our listening muscle getting stronger as we walk with the Lord? It has to be. I pray that the Lord would help us and that he would make us, um, he would preserve us in that pure and simple devotion, firm until the very end.